Mitch for Indigenous Insights, Eagle Radio's weekly Anishinaabe radio program. Joining us on the show, we have Jana Schmieding. Jana, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Yeah, this is awesome. Uh, so the first question, uh, in my research, mostly from Wikipedia and IMDB, I found that you are a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. Is that right? right? I am uh, enrolled Cheyenne River Lakota Sioux Tribe, um, and I'm... Um, both Minikanju and Sichangu Lakota. Awesome. And there's a short quote from you that says you were raised pretty traditionally in the Lakota ways. What was your upbringing like? Um, you know, I was raised by a family of um, incredible Lakota matriarchs and, uh, you know, in a intertribal community in Oregon, Southern Oregon. So I was raised around a lot of um, Klamath folks and Warm Springs folks and uh, Northern California natives. Um, and yeah, my grandparents were sort of um, pillars of the uh, Indian community out there. And so um, I was raised with like a, a great group of uh, native people who had either, you know, left their homelands to uh, to sort of resettle in Oregon um, or were from the, the area, like Oregon was their homelands. But, but I also, you know, was raised as one of the only indigenous families in a small town in Oregon that was predominantly white people. And so I definitely have that uh, sort of a Rutherford Falls <laughs> like background a little bit. All right, and it says here that you studied theater arts at the University of Oregon, and then after college, you moved to New York to pursue acting. So it seems like you were pretty set on your path early on. How did you find that path? I think I've just always had a love for the performing arts, and I, I've always, you know, I was raised in a really funny family. I am sure that you know this, but Native people are hilarious. Um, we, you know, we have experienced a lot of struggle in our lives and uh, we, we come through on the other side with like humor and love and joy. And so I was really raised in an environment that sort of fostered those vibes um, for me. And, and I was raised by parents and grandparents who supported my passions. Um, so yeah, I started sort of as like a, a choir nerd in, in high school and then like a theater that like dipped into theater nerdery and then like uh when I when I went to um when I went to college I decided not only did I want to get involved with organizing and you know was an active member of the Native American Student Union at the U of O and was collaborating with all of the different ethnic cultural student unions at the time but I also really wanted to perform and I wanted to get better um so I've really just I just love learning I love learning about the craft of performing and I studied in London for a semester, um, uh, and and then yeah, I decided I want to move to the big city, both for the anonymity factor of New York, but also because you know that New York is sort of the theater a theater arts mecca um, in in the United States. So um, it didn't go exactly as planned when I got there, but <laughs> I I. You know, I had these visions for myself that I wanted to like one day be performing in Midtown. And while it didn't end up being on Broadway, it definitely ended up being in small comedy theaters in Midtown. <laughs> <laughs> so what was that like that? Was that also a big part of your education when it comes to everything that you do? Yeah, I mean, I, I became a teacher when I moved to New York because I, you know, I needed an income to support my comedy learning. Um, and so I took classes in improv comedy and sketch comedy and um, I, you know, I continue to take classes in performing in different kinds of comedy. I love learning about it. Um, but ultimately in New York, yeah, I, I was a teacher by day and then I would rush down and be taking classes or performing or eventually, you know, after 10 years directing and coaching comedians and uh you know sort of learning all of the different aspects of the world of uh of performing comedy and writing comedy and you mentioned your family uh was supportive in your trip because that's a pretty long trip from oregon to new york 
it sure is. Yeah. I think, you know, there was something about, you know, I'm sure that there are, you know, uh, other reasons besides just New York being a theater mecca that I decided to move. One of them being, you know, I, I grew up in such a small town and everybody knew who we were as a family. So it was really like, I wanted to be in a place where I was, my identity was challenged a little bit. And, and it was, I, you know, I, I chose New York because it's so big and because it's, it's so hard. Um, and I really like a challenge. So it was a, it was a grind. Um, and, and my parents were supportive, uh, you know, they still are, um, my parents and my, my grand, parents are all just very like completely supportive of my my dreams and my passions and my goals and that has been fundamental in getting to the place where I am now certainly yeah because I mean it, it sounds scary so Rutherford Falls you started out as a writer for the show and then you got brought on as co-star how did all that work out it was a surprise. I mean, being a writer alone was uh, already just such a joy for me. I was really ready to sort of give up on the dream of, of working in Hollywood. By the end of 2019, I had been unemployed for over a year and a half and I had no health insurance. I was really like, I had t taken this really hard career shift to try to work in TV and it wasn't working out for me. I was really... Um, sort of uh, deflated and thinking that the industry had no interest in, in stories about a Native woman, which was what all my writing was about. And I didn't feel like I was really being seen. Um, and so not only had I packed up my dreams of being a performer in Los Angeles, uh, I was ready to really throw in the towel on being a writer. Um, and then I met Sierra um, through, a, through a comedy friend and I invited her to be on my podcast and she, um, you know, was a guest on my podcast and we kind of hit it off and she, she asked for my samples and I gave them to her. So it really took another native woman to see me and to see my value and to see my humor and to like lift me up. And that's sort of how the, um, the role of Regan fell into my lap as well. It was really Sierra being like sl slipping me the audition for Regan, you know, in this sea of Native women who we've all seen on, you know, stage and screen, uh, she was, she like sort of pushed me in there and, and encouraged me to audition and I did. Um, and, um, you know, the rest is, the rest is history. <laughs> and I feel like this is one of those questions that like, but what was that audition process like? Did you get called back multiple times and how was that? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, steps involved in the audition process for a, for a TV show. I didn't really know uh, what to expect, but the first audition is for a casting director, and the casting director is somebody who you know hire is is hired by the show to help sort of narrow down the field. And so I got to meet with um, a pretty famous casting dress director here in Los Angeles named Allison Jones and. Um, that was already just like so magical to get the opportunity <laughs> to read for her. Um, I mean, she casts all of the comedy movies and shows that you love and have seen. She has cast them. Um, so that, and, and sitting down with her, um, at one point she said, you know, I was reading my, my sides with her, with her reader and she goes, where have you been? Why don't I know who you are? <laughs> and I said, probably because I'm native and there's no native comedy. <laughs> so, uh, and then, you know, then you have another audition for the producers. It's called a producer's meeting. And so that was me auditioning for like Mike Shore and Sierra Teller Ornelas, our showrunner and, and Ed Helms, the three co-EPs. Also the casting directors are in, in that meeting as well. Um, and then if you get past that meeting, it's sort of like you, then you do what's called a screen test um, where your test, they, they film your audition and you're reading with the, the, a person in your scene. So I did two different screen tests with Ed Helms where I came in and it's just like network people and the producers and uh, 
you know, they, they mic you and they, they turn on the camera and you're sort of like reading actual scenes from the show with your, with the, the, you know, scene partner. And, and that was actually really fun. By the time I got to that point, I was like, finally, I get to read with like an actor. (laughs) That was the comfortable part. Yes. Like, I'm, I mean, I've been doing comedy for over 15 years. So like reading with a per with another actor is like actually fun. It's a joy. Yeah. And it was Ed Helms. I'm reading with <laughs> yeah. Helms. Like who gets to do that? And yeah, he's cool. an amazing scene partner. He's just like so easy to, to perform with. So yeah, I did, I did two, uh, two screen tests and then, and in the second screen test, the, the week of the second screen test, I, I actually crashed my car on the way to that second screen. Oh. I, I, I accidentally, like, I hit wet road and I spiraled out of control and I, I, I didn't hit another car. I hit the, um, I hit the wall on the side Whoa. of the highway and I totaled my car. Um, I was fine and I immediately called Sierra and she, like, rushed over and picked me up. We basically abandoned my car on the side of the highway like a couple of criminals and rushed to the audition. <laughs> I mean, I got audition. <laughs> I mean, that was like Monday of that week. And then Wednesday of that week, the producers came in and told us writers, hey, we have to shut down for COVID-19. We're going Ooh. home. And then Thursday and Friday, we didn't come into work. And we didn't know what was going to happen with the show. And then Friday, Sierra called me and said, you have the part of Regan. And then it was just sort of a waiting game to see if we were even going to have a show. Okay. Yeah, that's a whole story there, I guess. But if I ask questions about that, that might take the rest of our time. Yeah. Uh, this is this is a big one that I wanted to ask, and it's another cliche one, but when it comes to your character, how much how much of the character is you and what is different? A lot of the characteristics of Regan are me. I mean, the, the writing of Regan, the character, is sort of an amalgamation of all of the women in the room, and three of the women in the room are Native, one of them being me, <laughs> you know? And so it's a lot of Sierra, it's a lot of Tazba Chavez, who is another writer, a Native writer, and a, and a lot of, like, my personality. Um, and so I share some, you know, and I brought some of my own characteristics to the character, as one does. Uh, um, uh, the stuff that isn't me is probably like sort of Regan's um, her confidence. Like she sort of walks through the world being like, listen, I have opinions and they may suck, but uh, I'm going to say them anyway. You know, she, she like doesn't really get tongue tied and uh, that is not who I am. She's also like very, um, she's very uh, brave romantically. Also not me. <laughs> All right. And oh, what's it like on set? I mean, what's it like working with everybody? Well, this has been my first time actually like on set to this degree. The culture on our set was so wonderful and warm and loving. And and you know, my first experience on set was during COVID-19, so it was very safe. We it was like, you know, mask wearing and 6 feet apart and I don't think it was a you know, a lot of people kept telling me like, this isn't what it's really like, you know, on set. And I would be like, well, what's it like? Like, tell me what it's like. And they're like, I don't know. We have food carts. <laughs> Ooh. I mean, that I right there is interesting. <laughs> I was like, okay. So it's just food carts, but we didn't have food carts um, <laughs> because of COVID-19. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, it was just like a, despite the the challenges of COVID-19, it was such a fun and joyful experience being on set with Ed and Michael Gray Eyes and Jesse Lee, Dustin Milligan. I mean, all of the people who I got to perform with and also the crew was just incredible. And the directors were just really fun. Each person brought their own flavor. And it was just like, the, it was just such a fulfilling collaborative experience ultimately. All right, last question. So now you're speaking to Native America here like to all the youth or people who might have a dream and they think they might have doubts about it. What do you have to say to those people? Cause I like your path. I like your journey, all of it. What do you have to say to them? You know, here's what I'll say about it. The, the path doesn't always go in the direction that you expect it to. And, and um, especially in the indus- in the, in the performing arts industry, you know, there are so many different like um, entry points into this type of work. And I, you know, 
I studied theater arts in college, which is like makeup, hair, costuming, lighting design, sound design, you know, uh, uh, stagecraft, script analysis, writing, like there's just so much, there's so many different entry points into this industry. And I really think that like, um, finding sort of your focus is like a really great part of that. But also, um, when I didn't think that I would make it as a performer in this industry, I, I, I uh, set my sights on writing. I decided that I wanted to be a person who told the stories. And um, so I don't think it's shameful to change your goal. Um, but uh, I encourage everyone to sort of stick with it. Because Native people are underrepresented in this industry, we have to exercise stamina. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Not, it's not going to happen overnight for us. So we have to really be willing to stick with it and, um, you know, build community with each other and sort of lift each other up uh, collectively. All right. Thank you. Miigwech for being here. Thanks so much for having me.